So Florian, thank you. And uh, thank everyone for persevering. Uh, Florian asked me to uh, just summarize some of the highlights in my research career, but I will do that with these three points in my comments. The first is to think about the lessons that we have learned. Let's see, can I use my pointer without making it go? <laughs> uh, the lessons from mother nature that in fact, even have application to the most basic of science. Secondly, I will talk about how evolution itself is changing. And thirdly, uh, what it may take, at least in my opinion, for us to see the survival of uh, civilized uh, society as we know it. So let me begin with the lessons from Mother Nature and by far the most uh, striking disease I have seen are shown in these six frames that I took of a patient brought in with cholera in Dhaka, now Bangladesh. And this poor cholera patient was quickly weighed. She was unconscious, had no pulse, and was taken by her husband to a cholera cut. And the remarkable nurses put three IVs into places that there should be veins. Recall that she has no pulse. So how they found those veins, I was very impressed by. But in just two hours later, after they would pour in as much as they could, as fast as they could, up to 10% of her body weight, she weighed less than 50 kilos, and only two hours later, she had already put three and a half liters of rice water stool into that sleeve of the cholera cot. But otherwise, she is ready to sit up and eat her curry for lunch. There's nothing else wrong. This entire disease is due to cholera toxin that's made by Vibrio cholera bacteria that are obviously acquired in the water that act very much like a number of drugs and hormones through adenylate cyclase, through the second messenger to form the second messenger, cyclic AMP. I had brought these toxins from DACA and Johns Hopkins where I'd been and I uh, was working on that, but was tired of doing adenylate cyclase assays and found that there was a guy, Al Gilman, in the pharmacology department, whose graduate student lived up the street from us. And so on nights and weekends, their automated uh, cyclic AMP assays were running, and we were able to sneak our studies into those. And after a few weeks, Al Gilman called me aside and said, Garant, what is this cholera toxin you're bringing into our lab on the nights and weekends with Larry Brenton? It sounds dangerous. I said, Al, it is dangerous. It does something to your enzyme, adenylate cyclase, that is different from any drug or hormone that you have on your shelf. It does three things. First of all, it activated all known adenylate cyclases. And I was using that to develop a Cho cell assay, but there were two other cells that responded in obvious ways that were interesting and worked. Uh, secondly, uh, it locked that enzyme in the on position. Now, all the drugs and hormones, if you remove them, the effect goes away immediately. With cholera toxin, you could remove it after a 10-minute exposure, but it would continue probably for the life of the cell. Now, that has clinical relevance because the life of the intestinal epithelial cell is two or three days. And so 24, 48, 72 hours, the cholera patient will, even if you kill all the vibrios, they will continue to produce watery diarrhea at up to a liter an hour. Think about it, 24 hours, 48 hours, 
the cholera patient will put the equivalent of their body weight into the sleeve of that cholera cut. So you get an idea of what a dramatic disease that is. But the third distinction of cholera toxin activating adenylate cyclase was really intriguing to even my level of pharmacology understanding. All of the drugs and hormones may or may not even be additive. However, cholera toxin, which activated it far more than anything else, not only allowed it to be additive, but actually increased the effect of any drugs that were put on in addition. That unique trait is what helped, was a key that I think helped Al Gilman uh, and Marty Rydbell uh, discover G proteins for which they shared the Nobel Prize in 1994. <clears throat> it was a couple of years later that Ferry Mirahad, who uh, we were hearing from Florian about earlier today, an extraordinary friend and colleague, was down the hall with Bill Arnold in his lab, blowing smoke on aortic rings and watching them relax uh, the muscle, smooth muscle. Uh, so he was also running these uh, cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP assays. And I had some conflicting data with an E. coli toxin, ST, and took them to Murad to run through his assays. And we discovered something that was absolutely wrong. Whenever there is a yin with cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP is supposed to be a yang in the opposite direction. So I was going to use that to improve absorption. But we put cyclic GMP into a, an animal model, and sure enough, it also caused secretion. It was a yin yin. That violated all of our previous notions. Uh, it turns out that was unique to the particulate guanolate cyclase. Soluble cyclase probably does the opposite, does do the opposite. But it's fascinating that E. coli ST taught Homo sapiens how to make guanolin uh, long before Homo sapiens came onto the scene, which is a kidney mediator hormone that helps you diurese under a little bit of stress that we may be experiencing from time to time. So that was much of the first half of my career when I started understanding another group of people in, affected by Mother Nature. And that was these favela children who live with this kind of water supply and sanitary conditions uh, in abject poverty. And Leonardo Mata had shown that their repeated diarrheal illnesses would literally pull these children off of a normal growth curve in the studies in Guatemala in the mid 70s. But if you could catch them at time point zero shown here and rehabilitate them with nutritional rehabilitation, they actually experience catch up growth and might even respond to that normal growth curve. However, if you just stop the diarrhea, but don't nour nourish them, this is relevant to Dr. Sina's uh, talk later, uh, then they will follow that new trajectory. However, if they keep getting slammed with repeated one illness after another, they are pulled progressively off of that growth curve. And we can model this in uh, animal models. Mice, given cryptosporidium, a uh, common infection in the children, will lose some of their weight or fail to grow. But if we take the malnourished mice, uh, as shown down here, the effect of cryptosporidium infection is even greater. And this is not only obvious with the growth curves, but if we look at the transection of the small bowel, there's an effect of malnutrition, there's an effect of infection, but the two in combination is devastating to the gut mucosa. Uh, 
Furthermore, if you take the identical inoculum, two aliquots of the same inoculum on the same day, and feed that to nourished mice in the blue bars and malnourished mice in the green bars, you can see that at peak infection, that's a log scale. This is a hundred thousand times more shedding in the malnourished mice with the same identical initial infections. And so that also remains very intriguing to me because it's associated often with inflammation, not only in the intestinal tract, but also in the central nervous system that I think becomes apparent. But it's clear that there is a vicious cycle of enteric infections with or without overt diarrhea and malnutrition, and that malnourished children get far worse infections. And in fact, that also may have an effect on the children's cognitive development, as we'll return to, and even their later life metabolic syndrome, which is costly and can obviously contribute even further to poverty, with which this is obviously a terrible, vicious cycle. But these three new diseases, I'll call them, need to be defined in order to study them and assess what helps and what doesn't help resolve those problems. So the interesting thing to us was that in the late 90s, we had the capacity to go back and see the children that we'd studied from birth for their first two years of life with heavy diarrhea burdens. And it was in that situation that we learned to do some cognitive testing and learned that there was a striking correlation with their early childhood diarrheal illness burdens. And that was controlling as best we could for socioeconomic status, maternal education, and all the other things, although that's always uh, complicated. However, what we found was that the effect was primarily on this higher executive function, which we could only test after they were seven to nine years of age. And that the effect that was most, pro most profound was on semantic fluency and not so much on the phonetic fluency. Now, Phonetic fluency is maybe as many uh, words that begin with a consonant sound, which is like all sort of like rote memory. But semantic fluency is name as many animals or fruits as you can in a minute. And that requires retrieval from another brain region. And let alone that these are Brazilian children, they know more uh, fruits and uh, uh, plants and animals than we do. But they're compared with each other. And this was something that we would like to come back to because when that defect in an elderly person with which every listener to this is surely familiar, painfully so, with either loved ones or known loved ones that have this horrible disease of Alzheimer's disease that affects predominantly that higher executive semantic fluency function. And my dear mother, for example, uh, in her late 80s had Alzheimer's and she had been quite an accomplished pianist, but we were walking down the halls in the nursing home uh, to a piano in the lobby. And she turned to me and said, you know, you remind me of my son, Dick. And I said, mom, it's probably because I am your son, Dick. And the nurse started crying. And we walked to the piano bench. My father sat her down and she looked sort of bewildered, but she'd always played by ear completely. And he started humming a couple of bars uh, of her favorite song, and Stardust. And she broke into a concert. It was unbelievable, all up and down the keyboard, that she could have literally been on stage. Uh, and that 
is obviously a sad deficit in a child in an elderly person, but that in a child is devastating. And so that's the reason we decided to take a look at this Alzheimer risk gene, APOE4, and found again the totally wrong answer. What we expected was 180 degrees wrong. It was not worse in those children. It actually protected their cognitive development if they were experiencing heavy diarrhea and malnutrition. I'm going to come back to that. But it's very clear now that enteric infections not only cause diarrhea, but probably even more profoundly now that we have oral rehydration, I, are these other lasting effects on stunted growth or impaired cognitive development, either through stunting or independently, and even later life metabolic syndrome. And again, either through stunting and obesity uh, or independently. But we shouldn't be too surprised that these first two years of human life is so profoundly important. And I'm not even a pediatrician, people here are, but uh, I have to admit that anyone listening who's over two years old is over the hill, sorry about that, but we peaked at age two, by, whether by brain weight or by synaptogenesis. Newborn homo sapiens, newborn humans, as you can see, have very sparse synapses. And yet within two years, that little creature is walking, talking, has a personality that it may be the rest of their lives, and it is peaked at their synaptogenesis. Yes, we gain a few after that, but we trim more. So we peaked at age two. That's when those synaptic tracks are laid down. And that's the window in which these children are most seriously vulnerable. Now that gets me to my second point, which is how evolution itself is changing. One of the ways that it's changing is that unlike oral Darwin's plodding natural selection that took two or three million years to develop those 14 finches that he described in the Galapagos, human behavior is dwarfing Darwinian natural selection. In our own, not just lifetimes, in the last three years, we have seen the virus that Bill Petrie and others are going to mention and talk about move from having been sequenced to an mRNA vaccine, and that's nothing short of miraculous. Lest we get overly confident, however, since that time, the virus has found ways to evolve as well, and 12 of those 13 strains are somewhat resistant to all of our immune responses. Bill may want to comment further about that. The second way that evolution itself is changing and faster and faster is that the survival benefit of specific genes uh, or traits may in fact change over time. And I'm going to suggest that that APOE gene that we mentioned may be like that. That was a gene that was once protecting the cognitive development of people who were experiencing repeated gut infections and malnutrition, as all of our grandparents and great-grandparents were, if you go back two or three generations, where family graveyards have children who died with typhoid fever at age two. That is something through which all of us, no matter where we live, have ancestors that have weathered those storms. And that's why when we could get rid of the horrible water and sanitation problems of poverty, this would only be a terrible disease of Alzheimer's disease, which obviously has other genes, but this is by far the most predominant that we know about at this point. And so 
in this sense, like sickle cell anemia, which is in our gene pool because it was protective of the children with malaria uh, who were less likely to die if they carried sickle cell trait. So I think ApoE4, like hemoglobin S, may well be a balanced polymorphism or antagonistic pleiotropy trait that was once selected for, but then became threatening traits to healthy survival. So in addition to those two recognized gene traits, there are others emerging. And the thrift alleles that were driven by famine, like the Dutch hunger winter famine that's been so extensively studied, can lead to the upregulation of obesity and metabolic syndrome genes. But then there may be other traits that are not so well defined genetically. Uh, aggressive behavior was once a really critical survival trait, yet now I believe that could be our greatest risk for survival. And there are a number of others in this little book on evolution of evolution that I did. I think I have a table of 10 or so, but I want to return to this one at the bottom about this concept of who we are, because I really think that the secret to our survival as a civilization that I care to be any part of is terribly dependent on the two very different domains of inquiry of science and the humanities. Because either one alone, science with no humanities or moral values can be either great or horrific. Conversely, the humanities that ignore good science can be equally horrific. Hence, I feel very strongly that we must, in order to survive, this is a new survival trait we must develop because it may well be in our control, I hope. And that is that we redefine self, not as our gender or our tribe or our nation or our race or whatever, despite the rich cultural diversity, but that we de redefine self as members of the human family. And who are we and who are they is what determines our behavior. Now, this session uh, yesterday opened with the great honoree, Professor Whittingham, who eloquently described how his lithium batteries could really shape the evolution of the planetary climate, as well as access to education and equality. These things that we all carry are amazingly ubiquitous, even among the poorest in many instances, to my astonishment. That has the capacity to spearhead equity better than anything that I've seen. Uh, alternatively, of course, lithium batteries could explode bicycles or schools or airplanes. And so we have to link our science with our humanity. So in my penultimate slide here, I wanna just try to address our humanity with this drawing of a young girl in our study who had struggled with some of her tests and had a lot of diarrhea in her early childhood. And after all the tests, we, I asked them to just draw a child because I remembered in my pediatric training back there somewhere that I, a child of seven to nine years of age will draw themselves. And I brought these pictures back to Pete Patrick in our uh, uh, child psychology uh, department and was showing him these. I said, Pete, this one drawing just blows me away. I said, most were little stick figures and none, none came close to this drawing of an amazing little girl with pupils in her eyes, eyelashes, hair on her head, her hat with a name on it, and I covered half of that, although she's very proud of her picture, so I can show you, and buttons on her dress, bows on her shoes, and I was even, have to 
be explained by uh, some people who understood it better than I did. High heel shoes were tremendously important to this little girl's image of who she dreamed of herself being. And I showed this to Pete Patrick. I said, it makes no sense. He looked at me and he asked a question that I'm going to ask you. What's wrong with this picture? Now, giving the audience of however many it is a chance to think, it's obvious that she has drawn this elegant child with absolutely no hands whatsoever. Pete Patrick said entire books have been written about this, and it signifies the beautiful person that she aspires to be, but without her hands. I have trouble telling her the story. <laughs> she feels no sense of empowerment to deal with her life in life. So let me conclude. We've talked about lessons from nature, even from the most basic of science, lessons from populations that continue to teach us. We've talked about how evolution itself is changing with ever increasing speed, faster and faster. The drivers are changing. It's now Homo sapiens human behavior that's driving an awful lot of evolution without ever having a chance to evolve in nature. And there are traits genetically defined or perhaps not so well defined yet that were once advantageous, but that actually become the greatest threats to our very survival. And so I conclude by saying that I believe our survival itself depends on our learning to bridge our science with our humanity, on seeing self as a whole human family, in short, on caring. And the one thing I'm sure, and that is that these children's futures is what will determine our children's futures. And so with that, I'll close by thanking my tremendous patient colleagues, all of you, and my immediate and professional family and the many study families who have taught us so much. And to quote my favorite African proverb, I am because of you. Thank you.